Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the introduction to Bango Investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your question at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and if you would give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd like to hand over to Paul Larby, CEO from Bango. Good morning, sir. Good morning, and thanks everybody for joining. If you are joining us live, a very good morning to you. And if you're listening to the replay, then, then we very much appreciate your time uh, to listen to us today. This is a, an introduction to Bango. If you're familiar with our uh, investment case, if you've spent a lot of time on our website and maybe watched the videos from our strategy day, then much on, if not all of this, will be very familiar. So the aim of here was for people who are less familiar with, with Bango and what we do and how we do it and, and, and what the investment case is, uh, rather than those who are most familiar. But having said that, we'll obviously address any questions that anybody asks uh, at the end. But uh, really the goal here is to provide an introduction. And I'm joined today by uh, Matt Garner, our CFO, uh, and Rebecca Jameson, who heads up uh, our investor relations function. So together, the three of us will walk you through an overview of Bango and um, hopefully uh, share some of the excitement that, that we have of the business and, uh, and hopefully that will be uh, that will be infectious and you'll, you'll take away here the, the excitement that we share in, in the future of the company. Our vision is all about becoming the technology behind every payment choice. We're very clear that we're a technology company and the word sort of choice is also very important of that. And there are at a high level two ways that we are we will achieve that vision and the first is by making online commerce frictionless. And that allows people to purchase goods online with as minimal friction as possible. So get the highest possible success rate, make purchases as easy as possible. Um, and we focus very much there on what we call sort of loosely alternative payments, which is largely anything other than credit card. Uh, carrier billing being the most obvious examples. You buy something, you charge it to your phone bill. Wallets being something we've dealt with for a number of years, but also increasingly bundling subscriptions. So you tie in maybe a, a Netflix subscription onto your BT phone bill, for example. The second area that we focus on to make become that technology behind every payment choice is about sort of giving people more choice. And it's about using the payment data we have to make marketing more effective and helping app developers in particular better target their marketing to find paying users. So using what we call purchase behavior targeting technology to give people more relevant ads, to help them find the content they look at and to help the app developers find the customers who sort of have a demand for their app and their particular game. And both of these sort of accelerate the growth of the platform. We will talk a lot about the platform, but we have very much a platform approach. And it's sort of, a, there's a natural momentum around it. It's almost like a snowball at the top of the hill is the more people connected into the platform, the more everybody benefits because we have this sort of cross-platform approach to analyze data that helps us make commerce frictionless and helps us better target marketing activities. And the more people that join, the more everybody who's already in benefits. Just to give a, a little background uh, on the company, you've probably you've done any research, so you know we're around just over 20 years old now. <clears throat> Starting back in sort of end of 99, beginning of 2000. Uh, very much uh, with the key focus that uh, the internet would come to mobile and, and mobile will be a dominant way of, of using the internet. And that tenant seems very obvious now, uh, I think less so uh, for sure 20 years ago, where we had uh, you know very limited data capabilities, very, very limited handset capabilities. But that's how the company was formed. And over that period is very much focused on how do you how do people make money? If, if, if you assume that's going to happen, how do people make money? Uh, and the company sort of ridden its way through uh, a number of years. And Anil and, and Ray, who uh, founded this business uh, 20 years ago, both of whom were still with the company, Ray's executive chair and Anil's the chief marketing officer. Uh, I've seen a number of sort of pivots in the in the sort of the industry. If we go back far enough, we saw like an operator era, right? Operators were very much walled gardens approaches. They all need to be the supplier and own all the content uh, that people access through through mobile devices. And, and Bangalore did an awful lot to help uh, companies like you know, Singular in the US and, and Vodafone really, really monetize that content. Uh, the company was then listed the name in 2005 as part of a, a look to expand globally. As we saw a shift into sort of the device era, where we sort of started to see, you know, iPhone and Android, uh, you know, really to start to dominate, taking over from the sort of the BlackBerry and Nokia that had previously dominated the, the device ecosystem and the shift to that sort of app store model. And we're in a phase now, I think, where phones are so, fun so fully functional, the, the blend between wireless broadband and wireline is now, is now, especially with 5G, getting harder to, to, to discern. 
that really when they sell a merchant room, really know what's driving people's usage is, they want access to all the content on the mobile phone and on any device at any time. And we've got to that back to a point which I think is the steady longest day, which is what we call the merchant era, where content is king. The fact that 5G and cloud means I can get access to my content anywhere, means I want to be able to purchase that content on any device and watch it on a different, potentially a different device. So that, that sort of blending of sort of access and technologies away from just being very mobile centric to being very generic where the content is really what drives uh, the industry moving forward. And that's really uh, the phase of the business that we're, uh, we're in now. If you've seen anything on our website at all, you'll hopefully seen us talk about the virtuous circle. And this really is, I think, one picture that very much describes our strategy for growth. Uh, it starts at the top with merchants who have goods to sell, uh, whether that's an app developer in the Google Play Store, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Amazon, uh, whoever, whoever it is. Uh, we connect those people moving around to the right to paying users uh, via somebody who has a bill on which we can place that charge. We call those people payment providers. Uh, it could be a mobile operator, but could be in any other vertical as well. It could be a generic telco. Uh, it could be somebody with a store card. It could be an energy provider. It really doesn't matter. Uh, so all the, that run that right hand side generates this big pool of payment data, which you can then use to better target marketing, creating what we call some payment insights or audiences of users based on our purchase behavior targeting technology that allows the marketing teams to be more effective, that allows them to generate more paying users, that generates even more payment data, which means we can generate more insights. So two quite different businesses, but centered around this virtuous circle where growth in one really fuels growth in the second. Just to give you a flavor of the customers and the brands that we focus, there are three sort of vague, you know, rough segments of sort of customers. The first of those are the the online merchants. Uh, so that's the, you know, what you'll see here, I think, is, is is this is all about global. What you won't find us doing, which there are, and there are companies that are specialized in this, is finding 15 merchants in Turkey, for example. That's not what we're about. We're about finding merchants who are global and have global reach and global applicability. And that everything from the big name brands like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Spotify, YouTube, Netflix, et cetera, down to some small brands that you may or may not have heard of, but have global appeal. On demand China being a good example of a company that has Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Latin content in local language that they want to distribute on a global basis. And for us, that's the strategy. It's all about integrate once, distribute globally. And we're really focused on making the merchants grow. And the merchants are really, for us, the center of the universe, because if they grow, then we will naturally grow as well. Once we've got all those goods to sell, we need a bill on which to place that charge. As I said before, we call those the payment providers. Uh, historically, and that's where the, the bulk of our business is today, is very much in the telco space. I have to say it's moved out of mobile, so we no longer talk about ourselves as a mobile commerce company anymore because we don't think that has a relevance in this new merchant era. It's all about, we don't care whether it's a fixed line bill or a pay TV bill, uh, a fixed broadband bill, a cable bill, or a mobile bill. It really doesn't matter to us. And also we're extending into other verticals as well. But again, you know, we support some of the biggest names uh, in the telco industry as part of our, our payment provider customers. And then all those generate all this payment data where we help app developers to better target their marketing using this purchase behavior targeting technology, creating what we call bang audiences. Uh, and again, some of the largest uh, app developers in the world, some of which are not household names because they're sort of sort of you know, the, the company name is often hidden behind the app name. Uh, but these are you know some of the largest app developers in the world who use the technology and the payment data we have to better target their marketing to find those paying users. So good. Okay. A brief look at each of the businesses in turn, just to give it a little more uh, context. If we start with the, the payments, there are th sort of three sort of key areas that we uh, that we sort of support for payments. The first of which is very traditionally carrier billing. Uh, so you buy a bag of gems from the Google Play Store and you charge it to your phone bill, and that's the sort of the example that's on the left. But equally, you could buy that same bag of gems and charge it to a wallet, right? And that's sort of if you like the, the example on the right. In both of those also, we support not just digital goods, we're very unique in supporting physical goods. Uh, so we're the only integrator for Amazon in Japan that integrates them in both into carrier billing as well as to some mobile wallets that allow people to buy anything they want from Amazon.co.up. And just as I have a credit card with Amazon.co.uk, and these people charge things to their phone bill or wallet and spend thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars a month on anything from TVs, groceries, Alexa devices, Amazon Fresh, whatever, anything that's on the Amazon store and charge it to their phone bill. And we're unique in that in digital goods, you know, physical goods, there's a much higher barrier to entry than, than digital goods. You have different tax rates for different goods. You have partial shipments, partial returns. 
And so that was technology we deployed many number of years ago, uh, which is really, uh, you know, cuts business with Amazon in Japan uh, has continued to grow. The section in the middle uh, is, very, is very interesting, and this is probably one of the fastest growing parts of the business, and that's around subscription bundling. And that's where you connect one subscription service to another. So telcos have been doing this for many years. They've sort of triple play, quad play services. But what they were doing there was bundling first party services. So they were bundling their own data minutes with their own voice minutes, with their own TV packages. Now, because of that sort of split of content and the emergence of companies like Netflix, and Amazon Prime, and Ripbox, and companies like that, that's sort of become very fragmented. So now that's extended naturally in the telco space to bundle first to third party services together with their own data plans. So here you can see an example from BT where you can get Ripbox or Microsoft Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and tie it into your BT formula and have that charge placed on your phone. And this is one of the fastest growing areas of the business in two ways. Firstly, it's normal traditional payment business, but as we'll see a little bit later, it also forms the basis of what we call our platform business, which is our relatively new uh, you know, SaaS type licensing model, uh, which is incremental business on top of the on top of the payments business. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Just to give more context in terms of you know why why bang on why people pay for us, we've never seen ourselves as a utility. We're not about creating the most efficient trench digging machine to put water pipes in the ground. We have a really we have a really nice stretch digging machine, but it's sort of hygiene factor. For us, it's all about once that pipe's in the ground, how much water can we get through it? What pressure can we build it up to? How do we get payments as successful as possible? How do we make sure that as many users as possible are using that payment service so that everybody grows, the, the payment provider, the merchant, and then naturally Bangle as well. Uh, and data is, is, is the heart of that. We have a service called Boost Plus, and, and, and before that just came Boost. It's all about doing everything from ensuring that there's a, if a payment fails, it's retried, ensuring that if there's a call to action, a user needs to do something to top up, they get the right call to action that makes it easy for them to top up and then automatically retry the payment, um, to help in looking at the payment patterns to allow uh, operators like do in the Middle East to re-advertise to customers, say, hey, you use carrier billing, but we noticed you've not used it for a while, why don't you come back and we'll, you know, we'll give you a little discount. Um, all the way through to looking at subscriptions and how do we maximize the retention rate on monthly subscription renewals. And we did this for an operator in Japan. We saw subscription renewals increase from 85% on a monthly basis uh, all the way up to 95%. So everything we can do to generate more payments and you know get more pressure in that pipe and push more water through it is really how we differentiate ourselves uh, in the payment business. And that's generated this huge volume of payment data. You'll see when Matt goes through the numbers, we processed $4 billion uh, last year through the platform. Um, and what we tried to do is sort of package this into what we call purchase behavior technology, which is all about, if you sort of think of an analogy, about 20 years ago, Google allowed, allowed marketing teams to target based on what people had typed into a search bar. About 10 years after that, Facebook allowed people to target based on what people had liked or what their friends had liked. You know, what we're doing with Bango, we're allowing you to target based on what people actually pay for. We think that's much more powerful. And especially in the app developer space, it's incredibly powerful because if you talk to any app developer, 80% of the revenue comes from 5% of the users. They're not, you know, in-app advertising is a very small piece. There's a vast number of users that download games but never pay. That 5% of users who make regular purchases, buy those bags of gems, bag those coins, are really where the, the value is for the app developers. And let's say that 8% of the revenue of 5% of the users. And because we have so much payment data, we know exactly who that 5% are. And so that makes it a very, very valuable data set for the app developer indeed, in, in fact. So what do we do with that data? Well, we group it into what we call audiences. So Mango audiences. And that's a group of users that have very similar paying characteristics, which could be how often people pay, what they spend it on, the type of content they buy, when in the month they buy, what's their average lifetime spend, et cetera. Uh, and so we create these audiences of users. So we have a lot of generic ones. If you go to bang.ai, you can see a lot of generic ones. And we also create some custom ones uh, for, for app developers as well, all helping them better target their marketing so that they can focus their marketing activity on, on users that are known to, known to pay. Just to give a little example of the sort of how this works, if you look at the top half of the slide, so the, 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 the where it says conventional uh, target X using a specific demographic, is what happens is if you take a sort of a 
Facebook as an example, and I, I use Facebook because something like 70% of the app developer ad spend is through the Facebook platform. There are a lot of Facebook users, some of which will spend in your type of game, some of which will spend a lot in your type of game, but they're very spread, it's quite, it's quite hard to find them. Um, so traditionally what you do is you apply a demographic to, okay, I know my game is usually paid by many adjacent to 25 year life football. And so you create a demographic filter to, to try and limit the field somewhat. Um, and then you, you spend money and you set a budget in Facebook to advertise to that, to that demographic. And it's, you know, somewhat random and Facebook will try to optimize it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's basically look whether you get somebody who likes football and downloads the game or whether you get somebody who's really into football and likes playing the games and actually downloads the game and then starts to pay. And historically, what you find is it costs you around thirty-five dollars. So you have to give 30, Facebook thirty-five dollars to show the ad to enough people to get one user to make that first, first purchase. And you can see that obviously becomes becomes very expensive and, and very costly. What we say is, which is sort of the bottom path, is look, you can do your demographic targeting, but if you take a bang of audience, we can give you a group of people who we know make purchases in football games. Some of which will fit in your demographic, some will not. And you can apply your demographic on top. You can just use our audience as it is. But we know these people make purchases in, in football games. And therefore, you get a much higher return on that marketing because you're focusing your market on a user that has a higher concentration of people with a known payment history. And what we see is that generates anywhere between a four and nine times increase in the return on ad spend. So in effect, taking that $35 anywhere down between sort of four and $12. So really big, big increase in, uh, in efficiency of marketing and what that means is those app developers actually spend the same amount of money in the Facebook platform, but they generate more users as a result. When they generate more users, that we process more payments, that gives us more payment data, and that virtuous circle continues. Just to sort of head off some of the, the common questions we get on the, on, the, on the business, and especially on the data monetization business, is generally around data security. I should start by saying here that we don't sell data, so data is never sold. Uh, what we do is share anonymized data with app developers through Facebook. They cannot look in uh, to that data. They can't see who's in it. All they can do is ensure that their ads are focused within it. So there's no data sold. Um, and regulations like GDPR or the US equivalent, which is the CCPA, uh, have actually made this business easy because it very clearly defines who has what role in the processing and the management of data. Uh, and if you look at where Bangor sit, the data is fundamentally owned by the mobile operator who has the bill on which we place that charge. And therefore, customer consent is responsibility of the mobile operator. And we, we reward that mobile operator for allowing us to use their data by revenue sharing a portion of our sales back to that, back to that mobile operator, anywhere between sort of zero and 25%. And that obviously changes the dynamic between us and the operator. We're no longer just a payments processor. We're also a revenue stream for them as well. So it creates a very nice new dynamic with the, with the operator just from a discussion and a sort of relationship perspective. But they, they're generating revenue from, the, from their data and they have the responsibility for managing that consent, and we, which is why we reward them by doing that revenue share. Within the platform itself, we have actually very limited uh, personal information. The only data we really have is an identifier for you, which is likely to be a phone number or, or an email address. We store that fully encrypted and hashed, so it cannot be reverse engineered. Uh, so we've got access to all the platform data. It would absolutely make no sense, and you wouldn't be able to get any phone numbers from it. Um, I say it's never sold. Uh, we just use it. And that's really the only data we have, other than what you've purchased and, and how often you purchase it. We don't know who you are, where you live, how old you are, what your gender is. We have really no personal information. We have an identifier that we can map to and use to find you in Facebook, and we have your purchase history, and that's really all. Then on the third side, if you're watching an ad, you're watching it in Facebook or TikTok or Google or something, those are platforms which, which you've already set up your preferences to see ads. So the, the, sort of the, the challenge of dealing with Facebook ad preferences is actually managed by you in Facebook when you set up your Facebook account. So if you look at where we sit, we sit in the great position where we have all the data that's really valuable, the challenge of managing the customer consent is on the operator side. The challenge of managing uh, the display of ads is on the Facebook side. But we have that platform in the middle with all the powerful data. So really a nice place to sit and to legislation around data has made this much clearer for everybody and has really allowed this business to grow. So let me pause there and I'll turn over to Matt who will sort of give a bit more context about how we make money and, and how we charge money and some of the growth we've seen. Thanks, Paul. Morning, everyone. Um, just up on the, the, the screen now, you'll see our, our revenue model, and you can see that it's differentiated into to two elements, the Bango payments and the Bango marketplace audiences. 
I'm going to just have a look at the, the Vango payments side, first of all. This encompasses what probably we consider the, the, the normal business that uh, Vango's been involved in. So the single purchase processing fees and the DCB element. Um, this element is the one that uh, is historically coming through from the element we do linking the merchants to the payment uh, providers. But what you'll also see now is on the left-hand side, the platform license fee, and, and Paul's touched on that already, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on that one uh, as we progress through the slide set. But this is where we are starting to see our platform being used by um, payment providers and also from the merchants um, using a one-off fee, and then that payment comes through onto our, our revenues. So it's a, a more uh, chunky and uh, time time inclusive uh, revenue that comes through. At the bottom, you'll also see the subscription processing fee, which Paul just referred to a couple of slide back, slides back, where uh, we're using a subscription basis for the likes of Microsoft uh, for their game passes, that again goes on to a billing platform. Now, all of these are really high margin products. They're close to 100% where the investment in the platform means that there's very little cost of sales. What that then does is also produces monetizable data, which Paul referred to is then used in the Bango marketplace audiences. So we use that information that's been gained from those three different elements of the Bango payments model mm -hmm. to go into the Bango marketplace audiences. But on top of that, we also see you'll see the bottom gray box of the Bango marketplace audiences. We bring in third party payments data also, which gives us further insights into what's being used and what's being paid for um, for the audiences. So we take that information and then we will charge the uh, customer a usage fee, usually based on their advertising spend, so between 7 and 10% of their advertising spend. And that one then also adds to our revenues. Now, that does have a slightly higher cost of sales than the, the Bango payments uh, revenues, where typically we will share back some of the revenue that we get from our customers to those people that are providing us with third party payment data. So that can go anything up to about 25% of the, the revenues coming through. Mm -hmm. So what that's done for us um, is given us some record growth in revenues. So the chart here on the left hand side, we've charted both the revenues and the EUS. So our, our six year CAGR on the revenues is close on 50% and the, on the EUS is close on 100%. Now, previously, this was always taken as a linked item, the link between EUS and revenue, and people used to take rate. As you can see from the discussion we had on the previous slide about the various different elements of revenue coming into both a Mango payment platform and also through the audiences, this is being broken more and more, and it becomes less of a, a tool that we use. Uh, the revenues themselves, they can have the, the various elements that are coming through from those ones, but the end user spend also is extremely important for us because it shows the amount of information we have available for the Bango audience's revenue. And so the increase in those uh, different spikes of, of, of revenue, so the increases from the Bango audiences, from platforms and subscriptions, really the relationship between the two is, is somewhat broken now. What we've seen uh, going on to um, the middle graph is that we've reached an inflection point with our uh, profitability. So. Last year in 2020, we saw ourselves moving profitable. And again, the indications that we gave from our trading update, 2021 is also showing that one. And that's coming through from the high levels of gross profit margin that we generate from the revenues. So that more and more just converts through to bottom line profitability. And we will continue to invest. So for the next couple of years or so, at least, we'll be investing in continuing to develop the platform and our sales and marketing teams. One, to ensure that the platform can continue to develop and support the growing amount of business, and also the sales and marketing to drive that growth that we have uh, across the rest of the world. So in the long term, that EBITDA should tend towards about a 50% margin. Currently, it's around about 30%. What that does also mean is that we've been able to generate cash to fuel this growth, which means that we don't need to don't need to go back out to the market. So from the graph on the right-hand side, you can see an increasing good cash position. And that cash is going to, again, earmarked along with the, uh, the, the profit side from the cost side to be reinvested back into the company. So the good news is that we can fund our ongoing growth from the continuing business that we have. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> 
we'll sort of wrap up this just by talking a little bit about the future. And I thought a good place to start at that is the market we, we operate in. And you'll see we sort of have sort of two pyramids, the one on the right where it talks about the payments business, the one on the left, the, the data monetization, that, that bank of audiences business. And I think, you know, the one thing we've seen is a massive adoption in, in sort of the in online commerce. And that's, you know, through COVID and the various lockdowns, actually the online commerce and the digitization of the economy has accelerated more than, than we've ever seen before. What is driving these people to spend more and more online? And if you look at the portion of that that we that we look at from an end user spend, we just said we did $4 billion last year. There's currently around 24 billion of the sort of 120 billion that's all that's spent in app stores uh, that's paid for using alternative payments. And that's expected to double in the next couple of years. We already have a, a healthy share of that. We've been historically grown at twice the market, uh, twice the market rate, uh, and so we very much expect that uh, that trend to continue. And certainly, we have the the footprint and the merchants connected to the platform. We were a very very growth focused. Uh, that there's no reason to, to, to you know, suggest that that uh, that growth growth rate won't continue. On the left, what you can see is you know there's a obviously in a, a huge amount spent in online retail advertising. We very much decided to focus uh, the bank audiences business, at least initially on the app developer market, because we have a lot of valuable data there and there's a, a specific marketing challenge in finding those elusive pain users that's uh, very unusual in the app developer space. And they spend around $80 billion uh, on app install, probably maybe north of 120 uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and if we take that and we look at it, we say, okay, a portion of it is uh, the very big guys who have, everybody has the app downloaded and they're trying to make existing users pay. So let's sort of take those out of the equation. And we'll take the small guys out who, you know, really don't have significant app marketing budget. Uh, if we take a piece in the middle, we think that's around sort of 15 to 20 billion. Uh, the way we charge this service is we charge a percentage of what you spend on your advertising. Uh, so you can see just by the very nature of maths, our, our target revenue, you know, potential for that is, you know, billions of dollars so it's a very very large market just in the app developer space alone uh, but clearly the technology could apply outside but you know our focus from the start uh, is on the app developer market so we focus in two very exciting markets both of which are growing very fast both of one of which the payments on the right we have a strong history and a real good track record of, of taking market share one on the left which is relatively new for us which were, which is growing incredibly fast uh, but obviously from a, from a smaller base but huge opportunity and potential uh, and runway in both businesses. <clears throat> the way we, you know, achieve that growth uh, on the on the payment side over the past five or six years is, is sort of busy using this sort of four-factor formula. It's about connecting more users by more routes, giving them more things to buy from more merchants and using that data that we talked about before, that, that angle boost and the boost plus to generate more users. And that, that's how we differentiate from the competition. It's very much on that that, that, that angle boost and that, that data insights piece. When you put all four together, it's surely an exponential growth we've seen in end user spending revenue that, that Matt took you through a few charts back. A couple of things happened over the past year, which I'll just highlight on this, which partnerships have become increasingly important. Uh, for us, back at the start of uh, 2021, we announced a partnership with TPA. TPA is a local carrier building aggregator in the Middle East. Um, and by doing one connection into TPA, we immediately gave all the global merchants who were connected into the Bangalore platform uh, access to 76 operators and wallets across 24 countries in the Middle East, Africa, and Turkey. So for us, that was the best way to expand and to give the global merchants the, the expansion of the footprint that they desired. We already had sort of 35 or so connections in that region, but this really just took us to the next level with, with more simple integration. And likewise, NTT Data uh, was a partner in uh, to help us get more access to wallets in Southeast Asia, some of which we still have direct, some of which we've had for a while. You saw the announced Cacao Pay. Uh, not that long ago. So wallets uh, continue to grow, but partnerships are a, are a great way for us of, of rapidly expanding and accelerating that growth. The other thing we saw in the more merchants is, is subscriptions and that the growth in subscriptions. I think if you look at the history, subscriptions have very much started with music and then moved into sort of video. Um, now we're in the era of gaming. So Microsoft Xbox, uh, you can with Game Pass Ultimate, you can get access to all those, all those different games on any device through a subscription model. And with Xbox All Access, you can also use that subscription to fund the console. So subscriptions are becoming more prevalent in every uh, in every area of our life. And with the trend from music to, to video to games, are getting more expensive and, and longer term in terms of subscriptions. One of the other things we saw in last year for the first time ever was somebody launched a subscription service targeted at a particular market. Um, Prime Video Mobile Edition that we helped Amazon launch in India 
is about a prime video solution, but for a mobile device only and a single device. So same sort of content, but very much restricted in use case to, to targeting at that specific population. And that's seen great growth as a service. And we would expect that sort of tailoring your subscription services uh, to continue as subscriptions, you know, continue to invade every every sort of aspect of our life. So all that's generated all, all the payment data we have, and then say we've seen good growth for the past five or six years. But back only in 2020, we announced what we called our first platform deal, which was um, a deal with an operator who basically wanted to use one platform to integrate multiple part, multiple third party services together. And so we developed this platform proposition, uh, which allows them to do exactly that. Uh, it's a very much a traditional SaaS model. So it's an integration fee, a license fee, and a maintenance fee. So true uh, recurring revenue. We know our first customer in 2021. We now have uh, five customers, including BT and Verizon. Um, we like this business because largely this is incremental. Don't forget, in many cases, in most cases, actually, we're being paid by the merchant to connect into an operator. And now the operator is paying us this platform fee to manage multiple subscriptions together because that allows them to differentiate the services that they offer to their customers and to bundle them together in ways they couldn't if they was all sort of through point solutions. So really nice business that's relatively new. And we like it because it's recurring revenue, but also because it's incremental to the payment business that we're already generating, both of which generate this huge volume of payment data. So the platform business itself uh, is very exciting. And just to put it into context a little bit, if we look at uh, the top 30 revenues, uh, top 30 telcos by revenue, we'll exclude China, uh, from this because it's a bit of an unusual mark. You can see the payments sort of row at the top. You can see where our payments footprint is. Many of these are Google Play routes uh, as well as other merchants as well. And that's continuing to grow. The ones in red are the ones that are not active yet, but are in sort of active discussion. So that's a, a footprint that continues to grow. And certainly partnerships have, have helped grow that in, in, in Asia and the Middle East in particular. And then resale and bundling, that's where the merchants asked us to connect one service into an operator. Again, really good footprint across the telcos and again, continuing to grow. And then the platform base, which is this new business, that's where operators, if they decide they want to bundle multiple services together, want a single platform to bring them together. You can see we have three wins over the top 30. Another two outside that top 30, a very, very healthy pipeline that we think conservatively just with the deals we have on the table at the moment, but just with those five deals, that should be $7 million plus in recurring revenue by 2023. Because it's tied into the platform, we use the same platform, it maintains that same level of gross margin, so it's still as close as you can get to 100% gross margin, gross profit business. Um, and that's incremental to that payments business. So that's, uh, for us, a journey we're just starting out on, uh, which we'll, we think we'll see growth accelerate uh, for the company in the, in, in the next few years. They reflect to the data monetization business, the more successful we are in that purchasing business and that platform license business, the more data we have. That's a really important part of how we're going to grow the, the Bangor audiences business. Um, but likewise, we're also bringing in data from third party sources like credit cards, other app stores, et cetera, et cetera. More and more app developers are coming to the platform. Um, historically, and the examples I think I gave earlier, I talked a little bit about games, but since now some of our biggest customers are uh, apps looking for first time depositors, uh, trading apps. Uh, uh, NFT uh, trading apps, crypto trading, stock trading, social casinos, any any app that relies on sort of first time deposits and purchase behavior targeting is, is very, very powerful there. Uh, and channels are also important for us, so more and more deals and partnerships with advertising agencies who can add the power of purchase behavior targeting to the portfolio when they when they pitch to clients. And we're running more campaigns. So we have TikTok as a platform. For example, we work with ByteDance to put uh, targeting technology into their advertising platform. Obviously, very fast growing, uh, but still likely the bulk of the spend is still with Facebook, but TikTok uh, is growing, uh, growing very fast. And you put those together, that creates sort of you know more, more paying users and, and, and more revenue for us as on, that, on that data monetization business. And we don't break out uh, the revenue stream, but we started to publish a couple of KPIs uh, which we think are sort of interesting to gauge our, that you can use to gauge our prog progress in this business. The first of which is the number of app developers we're engaged with. Uh, this is a slide from our strategy day back in October. So you can see we were up to some 5,000 each by sort of September. I believe that's now you know, in, ex in excess of nine. We saw great growth, but there's a lot of headway ahead of that. And there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of momentum in that business. So more and more app developers can use purchase behavior targeting technology. The next metric we introduced was called Bang Audience Days. And that was a measure of how many audiences are in use in any particular day, uh, in any particular month in this period is a quarter bundled together. And you can see, so the app developers were bringing in 
are using the audiences more and more because the growth in audience data is actually steeper than the growth in app developers. Um, so new app developers coming in using audiences, but existing ones using more and more audiences. So great growth in terms of audience usage. But in 2021, we actually changed the pricing model, which actually made the, the metrics slightly less useful. And then we started to charge not just for the use of an audience, but depending on how much money you were putting through it. And so there are some minimums, but basically we'll take anywhere between seven and 10 percent of what you spend in Facebook. So if you spend probably a hundred grand a month in Facebook, we'll take anywhere between sort of seven and ten thousand as our, our sort of fee for that. And what we're finding is not only are app developers using more audiences, they're now spending more money through those audiences. So there's a really, really nice growth trajectory on that business. Um, if we look at the sort of the 500 large developers that we sort of target as key accounts, we have six of these already that are generating over 100k a year of revenue uh, by using bank audiences and, and purchase baby targeting. Lots more engaged or earlier in the sales cycle, particularly techs and app developer once they come on board before they really start to spend significant portions of the budget. It takes around three to six months. They come in, they'll do some experiments, they'll do some A-B tests, they'll see it works, they'll expand it gradually. And then at a point in time, they'll just turn the tap on and pump all of their advertising money uh, through through bank audiences. And we generally see that sort of trajectory in sort of three to six months. So more and more of these developers come on, it creates a very nice sort of revenue stream of, of big customers. Uh, but likewise, we probably have we have way more uh, smaller customers than uh, than big customers. Some of those will grow through big customers, and some will stay as small customers. But the platform itself is built to be self-sustaining, so we can manage that customer mix uh, really well, obviously maintaining our, our sort of uh, investment levels. When you sort of put all all of these pieces together, you sort of get a graph that looks a bit like the one on the left. So with the, the the red bit of the business, that's sort of like historic business. That's our business as usual, and that's you know seen us grow sort of fifty percent CAGR each over the last five or six years. And then the two new businesses we start to see laid on are the licensing business, which will probably start to become more material in probably 2023 and beyond, but that really starts to grow rapidly. That's that recurring revenue from that telco platform uh, that's paying us in addition to the to the merchant to bundle those services together with uh, with fixed and, and mobile broadband bills. And on top of that, we have the bank audiences business uh, in the purple, uh, which we ultimately see uh, as being larger than the payments business of the time is when and you'll see there's almost deliberately no no timeline on this access because you know over the past sort of years we've grown from single dot single digit millions of dollars of revenue to tens we did 20 million dollars as you'll see from our trading update in 2021 but we're very clearly on a path to 100 and, and that growth will sort of accelerate as these two new businesses really start to kick in on top of that very solid base uh, which is you know historically the the driven the, the, the some of the numbers you've seen on mass charts previously so a very strong base on which to grow but two really exciting businesses with massive potential that, that layer up on top and there's opportunities outside of where we're looking at the moment there's a i think there's one of the questions that's come in is about what are the changes about in the app store uh, with apple and google and some of the law suits with epic there's been uh, lawsuits in korea and legislation in actually in south korea about breaking that monopolization of, of building an app store because the moment if you want to buy something in an app apart from a few exceptions uh, Apple or Google will sort of take 30% of that and force you to use their payment technology behind that. And we've been helping Google roll out that technology across operators on a, on a, on a global basis. But with that break in monopoly, there's, a, there's now a massive opportunity for app developers to, to, to connect directly with customers and to build customers directly. And the nice thing is, a lot of these app developers are already customers of ours because they use, uh, they use Bangor Marketplace and Bangor audiences to target their marketing. And now they're talking to us about how they add billing and how they take advantage of the additional capability which is building so that to us is a is a new opportunity which could potentially drive that red uh, slice at the bottom to grow even faster we look at the platform license business i've talked exclusively about telcos we already support bundling in the energy sector example where you want to differentiate an electricity bill by uh, adding in a streaming subscription we're just supporting in the retail sector where we can sort of bundle physical goods with a streaming subscription and then charge it to a loyalty card so the, the opportunity for the platform license business expands way beyond telco and into retail, into automotive. Um, and, and so while we're very much focused on telco and executing that space and we have you know, a great track record there and a great run rate ahead of us, there are other sectors where that same technology could apply and we could, we could easily expand into. But on the third one is marketplace beyond app developers. So purchase behavior targeting to, you know, outside of the, uh, the app developer space. And again, we've had some agencies run trials on because we know who has a music streaming subscription, 
adverts for headphones and smart speakers, you know, that's a, a classic targeting. So it absolutely applies in the, in, the, in what is a, a hugely massive uh, retail marketing sector. But for us, execution is key uh, and focus is really important. So that's what we've, uh, that's what we've focused very much on the app developer space. But great growth in each of the businesses, but the opportunity to expand outside of that at the right time uh, is clearly exists. And that's why we're so excited about the business and what we think, uh, you know, we've been on a great trajectory for the past sort of, five or six years in particular, but really we're at that cusp now where things will really start to change, and whether it's this year or whether it's next year, it, it's inevitable. It's, it's not a case of, of if it's going to happen, it's a case of when it's going to happen. And, uh, and that's down to us and that's down to execution and uh, that's what we're 100% focused on. So with that, I'm going to pause and then we'll uh, turn to the questions. That's great, Matthew, Paul. Thank you very much indeed for updating investors this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. But as well, the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted already. I'd like to remind you the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investment Company dashboard, and we'll notify you when that's ready for your review. Um, Rebecca, if I may be so bold, if I could hand back to you. Obviously, investors had the ability to pre-submit questions ahead of uh, today's meeting, and of course, you've received a number throughout. If I could ask you to read out those questions and give a response where it's appropriate to do so, um, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Absolutely. Um, Pepper, welcome coming. You mentioned several new deals and partnerships announced over the past sort of six to 12 months, and whether there's one that stands out as being the most exciting in terms of its potential to bang go. Yeah, that's a good. Question. I guess they're, they're all exciting, right? That's one of those reasons we announced. In fact, there's so much that happens that we don't announce just because it, I guess it's, it's sort of business as usual, that generic growth in in, in sort of the, the payments, which we, we we absolutely don't announce every every route at the moment, just because it's become business usual. So generally, if we do announce something, it's because it's exciting and naturally an excitable person. Uh, so I think they're all great. I think there are two in particular I'll point out. One of which is Verizon. That's a big, big design win in that platform licensing business. On top of the win we had with BT, and in the telco space, those design wins with the leading telcos are earlier. It's no point having sort of small telcos engaged at the start. You want the big telcos, you get those design wins, you get the features that they need, and then you can go and replicate it at scale. And that's why that's really important for that platform licensing business. And then outside of that, I think Digital Turbine, which is a partnership we announced recently, is will really be really exciting as we expand into that direct app store building. Digital Turbine have this sort of um, the way of putting apps and promoting apps with it on a device. Uh, and so we're already hooked into all these app developers who I'd say have this pent-up demand to sort of break out of the Google and Apple stranglehold that they have on payments and to to charge directly and to, uh, to reach those consumers directly. So that itself, I think, will, will sort of help accelerate that business. But uh, So those are the two that stick to mind, but I think for, for almost for different reasons. And on um, platform deals, we obviously showed the slide with the 30 telcos and the progress being made there. Whether you could comment on um, progress with mobile players in, those, in the UK and the US in particular, and how straightforward a process it is getting market leaders on board or what the main challenges are. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think generally with uh, with you, you know, if you work in the telco space, the sales cycles are longer than any of us would like, right? They generally move at a pace. So sales cycles are longer, but these are big, you know, tens of millions, multi-year deals. So by natural, they they take a little bit more, more, more time to progress. The platform business also is it makes a lot of sense for operators that have made that that conscious decision that they now want to focus on bundling third-party services together and that's what leaders like bt and verizon have very publicly stated is that for them it's all about bundling first third-party services with their first party services so outside of that what we generally see happens is we'll connect one service into an operator then we'll connect a second and then by the time we've got to the two when we're talking about the third and fourth they want now a platform to bundle that all together so that's generally how those sort of sales cycles uh, play out um, but the fact that we've got those key design wins early on means you know we have the features we're, we're a zero risk choice for any other operator to, to pick uh, you know we're clearly you know this is the platform license this bundling platform is, a, is an entirely new marketplace we have the, you know the, we're clearly in that market with all these big Verizon wins with all these big reference wins including bt and verizon so a very natural choice it's just a case of sort of navigating through the the sales cycle that is, is naturally a bit longer than any of us would like Space. Thank you. Um, you talked a bit about sort of competitive differentiators as we went through the slides, but could you touch on who the competition is? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we have sort of two different elements of competition. I think on one side, we on the payment side, our biggest com competition still is people who want to do it themselves. Um, so operators have IT teams, they want to connect into the merchants. I think the good news is the merchants don't want to connect directly into the operators. They like to go through sort of a middleman, and that's where 
uh, clearly we uh, we played an important role. Uh, other companies in there, obviously, uh, Docomo Digital is a, is a, a subsidiary of Docomo who competes in that space. Um, and also you know, companies like uh, like Volk, who are very much in that sort of traditional uh, sort of payment space. And when you start to do the resale and bundling, there's sort of a, there's less competition. When you talk about the platform license, actually the competition there again is do it yourself or some of the big VSS OSS players like Amdocs, where the competition marketplace for that bundling business is, is certainly very different. So we don't see the usual players in that space. We see very much uh, big companies like Amdocs, but we have such a powerful focus proposition. That actually, we're, we're not seeing uh, too much challenge in there in terms of uh, in terms of winning that business and growing our revenue in that space. You move on to the payment, the data monetization side, and actually, I think the competition there is the traditional way of doing things. We were very new with purchase behavior targeting technology, and actually, it took us quite a while to educate the market on why purchase behavior targeting technology is is so important and so valuable. And, and, and I think we've done that. And the good news is that you've seen other changes in the industry, like Apple's. Removal of the tracking ID, what they call IDFA, which happened in iOS 14.5, that removed a data source, uh, which makes means our data source is even even more demanding because one traditional data source that the app developer has used for their marketing uh, has disappeared. So the, 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 it's been a sort of a, a longer journey. I think we'd like to to, to educate the market on budget behavior targeting, but the good news is we have a tailwind from some of the things that happen in the market as other data sources. Um, could you talk a bit about how geographically diverse the business uh, and the revenue is and whether there are any new geographies you'd like to enter? Really? Yeah, I mean, we've got a, a wide range of geographies. Uh, we don't split it down too much, usually because of commercial sensitivities of our customers who don't really like us to disclose too much because it can give greater insights into the, to their business within certain areas. Um, but you can see from our, our splits down, we've, we've got areas within Europe, Asia, US, uh, South America. So we are moving across to revenue streams coming from uh, throughout the, the world and, and our relationship with the likes of TPay give us a, a route into the African continents also and, and Middle East. So that geography continues to expand. Uh, I think the areas where we have difficulty is usually regulations uh, in the likes of, of China and Russia. Uh, and that's where really there is that it's almost behind a curtain where we, we can't really pervade. But that said, what we do find is that there are a number of Chinese app developers who, because of some of the constraints now coming through into China with the limitations in usage on uh, games, are actually looking to try and bring their products further out into uh, the rest of the world. And that uh, route using the Vango audiences is a very um, good route for them to try and look to find a, a new audience. Um, sticking on sort of the financials, um, we showed Grass obviously with strong growth in the past uh, few years in revenue and cash flow generation, but concerned that the growth rate might appear to be slowing. And if you could comment on factors that affect the growth rate. Yeah, I, I said, no, I, I don't, you, you've got to sort of take a long term view of, of, of this business. So you think in 2020, we grew 70% in 2020. You know, I think partly what COVID did was accelerate that drive of online commerce. And in 2021, our, our growth sort of moved back more towards the normal level, but growing from that higher base on top of that 70%. So I think you've got to look at it at the long-term view. But as I said earlier, I think we're on the cusp of that growth starting to accelerate as that platform business starts to kick in recurring revenue, the bank audiences start to meaningfully contribute, then the growth rate will, will really start to kick up. And, you know, like I say it's not a case of if, it's a case of when. We'll see what that is over the next couple of years. I think actually that's, you know, we still are seeing growth in our, in our core DCB business as well. So that really does help us to accelerate really quickly. And, and that then converts, and then the slow, perceived slowdown in, in profitability and cash over the next couple of years is a deliberate uh, option from our side is to make sure that we expend enough on developing the platform and developing our sales and marketing drive to take advantage of this opportunity that we see to really drive forward our sales. So. For the next couple of years, we will do that reinvestment. We think that's the right use of the cash and the profitability that we're doing now to really give us the best returns for the future. And um, what impact, if any, do you feel wage inflation will have on margins in the next year or so? I, so I don't think it will have any, actually any impact on margin. Right? Our, our, you know, we're not a services business, we're a, we're a platform business. So if you look at our sort of a gross profit level, it will have absolutely no impact on margins. Uh, clearly have an impact on expense. I would say a couple of things. Firstly, we've not seen the brain drain on the massive wage inflation that I think other companies are very publicly uh, talking about. We have an incredibly 
a highly engaged uh, workforce. Our employee engagement score in 2021, uh, you know, in 2020, we grew the fastest we've ever grew in that employee engagement score, off an already world leading base. We grew again in 2021. The, the employee base is very, very highly engaged, well over 8% uh, employee engagement score, which is sort of off the charts in, in, in this sector in particular. And our, as a result, our churn is very low. Uh, so, as our drill to our, you know, our professional attrition in last year was less than 3%. So, that means when we're recruiting, uh, which for sure is harder now, we're recruiting to grow, we're not recruiting. Uh, to, to replace so we're in that nice position where we, we sort of have you know an employee workforce that's engaged and they're, they're all investors as well to, to some degree right we have a very strong stock options team we're very very big uh, on stock options we don't give rsus or anything like that we give stock options so that means employees benefit as the company grows and as shareholders benefit and we think that that reward mechanism does two things firstly it aligns everybody on the growth of the company and second, it means the team are very highly engaged and reinvested in the future of Bangalore. They're not in it for the short term. Uh, and you know, any, anybody can, all of us can go and earn more money, I think, by working somewhere else. That's not why we're here. We're here for the long term to make Bangalore successful because it's exciting, interesting work. And because we're all invested in it as part of the company because we have that strong stock options team. Thank you. Um, a question on uh, whether we see acquisitions playing a part of the future growth profile of the company or if there are any areas that we might want to take the business into through m a and I guess linked to that just to cover up at the same time with use of cash, what the approach is on um, dividend policy. Let me talk about m and then I'll, I'll let you talk about the, the cash piece. So, uh, you know, for us m and this is not, we're not about, we're not an m and we're not a grow by acquisition business. This has all been organic growth, but we have made acquisitions in the past. They've been very targeted to enter a specific geography or to acquire a specific technology. The most recent one we did was with a company called Audience with an S uh, from Italy. Uh, that we acquired because we wanted some uh, technology to allow us to publish uh, data sets into Facebook and to segment those data sets. We purchased that company, we took out the technology that's now embedded in Bangor audiences, and then we decided to what was left, we spun out what was left into a joint venture with NHN, which itself is building that, that sort of what's now called New Deep. That joint venture is, is building a very nice business using a sort of the, the data platform that they have to help uh, Shopify uh, customers maximize their sales on the, on the Shopify platform. Uh, so for us, that acquisition is really all about focus. It's all about anything that will accelerate the virtuous circle. So we're in that nice position where we have a nice, strong cash balance. Uh, so acquisitions are, are always possible and they're always in exist. But for us, this is not just about any acquisition just to show top line growth. We have enough opportunity for top line growth organically. It's about is there an acquisition that will deliver strategically meaningful returns by accelerating uh, that virtuous circle? Because so many acquisitions have you seen across the industry, especially in payments, but also in other sectors as well, they end up destroying uh, shareholder value and growth slows or stops once a company's been acquired. And that, that's not what you know. That's not what we're about. We're about accelerating growth, not just taking a step function of growth and then dropping back to a to a very disappointing growth uh, growth level. And from the cash perspective, again. I'm just being a bit of a repetition at the moment we we've clearly earmarked what we want to do with the cash that we're, we're currently uh, bringing in from our business um, and that's the development of the business but I think you know what we should point out is that previously we were going back to the market um, you know, some of the existing shareholders were getting a little bit diluted while we gained more cash to invest in the business to drive it on and now we've progressed to the, to the position where we are self-funding we know where, what we want to do with that cash and we'll invest into that as, it, as we progress, it, it again depends how the market is developing. Should, do we need to invest more to get greater returns? Then we will do that. Um, so we really need to, to just watch that space and see what happens over the next couple of years and the results from our, our investment of our, our current cash income. And dividend policy? A dividend policy at the moment, we're not making any dividends. We, we aren't looking at a dividend policy at this time. Um, you touched briefly there on um, the joint venture that with NHN and just whether you can mention the prospects for that uh, JB. Yeah, sure. That, so, so that joint venture now is very much focused on um, making, uh, helping Shopify customers and using the power in that data platform that that, that, that that joint venture has, which has been, you know, expanded by some of the capabilities that come from NHN, a very, very strong data company itself. To help Shopify customers uh, grow their base, and that that business is is, is doing really well and is getting great traction uh, in in that market. We're, we own forty percent, uh, so you'll see it accounted for uh, right at the bottom of the income statement. It's sort of a, an, an associate, uh, NHN owns six percent. We don't anticipate and we don't expect to we don't put any more ca cash in that business. The real focus there is on uh, on growing that business. It's, it's very well capitalized. 
uh, as, a, as enough cash to grow. It has real massive potential. Certainly, NHN made the investment in both the technology and, the, and, and as well as the financial investment because they see great opportunity in it. And whether that ends up as a, a you know large company, whether it ends up being IPO, we'll see over time. But it has sort of massive potential. Um, for, but it's sort of you know outside of the, the sort of the, the core bang of virtual circles. So the way to look at that is a, an investment that with lots of potential. Um, but really, our focus is on that virtual circle from a Bangalore perspective, how we grow and any returns we get uh, from, from that, uh, that joint venture are sort of uh, gravy on top, so to speak. That's great. Um, and sorry, oh. the last question I've got, <laughs> sorry, Mark, um, is just uh, you obviously mentioned on the final slide that journey from tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and what the biggest challenge might be to realizing that goal. I mean, I think it's, it's all right. I think one of the biggest challenges is just opportunity. We've seen we're at the point now where we have so much opportunity. Picking the right ones to focus on is, is absolutely key. Uh, that's why, you know, we focus so much on people like BT and Verizon to get those early reference wins. Uh, but a focus is, is, is important. We talk a lot about the opportunities in the markets. And therefore, as they're in the future, our key over the next year or two is to execute very well the segments and the app developer space for audiences in the telco space with bundling, continue the growth on that payments business. And then we'll then we'll be in the future, but then we can look to expand into other verticals in the next uh, in the next year or two. So focus for us uh, is the key because we're absolutely not short of uh, opportunity. That's great. Rebecca, Paul, Matthew, thank you once again for uh, taking time to take all those questions from investors. And of course, if any further questions do uh, come through, we'll make those available to you also. Um, Paul, Matthew, Rebecca, I know investor uh, feedback is particularly important to the company and I'll shortly redirect investors so they can provide you with their thoughts and expectations post your presentation today. But before doing so, Paul, perhaps if I may ask you just for a few closing comments. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Uh, I know there's, uh, there's lots going on and lots out there, so we do appreciate uh, everybody's time in joining us here today. And uh, thanks also for the questions. It makes it much more interesting rather than just sort of uh, uh, talking all the time, which uh, we do have a tendency to do, as you might have noticed. But we do like the questions and like to keep it interactive. Please follow up with any further questions at investors at uh, One of us will uh, absolutely get back to you uh, with an answer. We do like the... Uh, not just the questions, but also any suggestions or comments or what will be helpful for you as investors is very important. Uh, the Investor Meet platform, I think, is a, is a great way of us uh, engaging more directly with you. Uh, next point will be our results, which we publish on March 8th. So full year results for 2021 on March 8th. And uh, look forward to talking to you all again there. Thank you very much. That's great. Paul, Matthew, Rebecca, thank you once again. Ladies and gentlemen, please could ask you not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you in the order that you can provide your feedback so that management can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Bangor PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes the session and good morning to you all.